Bien, buenas tardes. Bienvenido a, a la Escuela Técnica Superior de Ingeniería de la Universidad de Huelva. Para mí es un honor presentar al, al doctor Idris Abercán. Él es doctor por tres veces con 20, 29 años, doctor bidisciplinario en neurociencia cognitiva, doctor en estudios mediterráneos y literatura comparada y doctor en, en diplomacia y neopolítica. Estoy traduciendo directamente del francés. Fue profesor visitante del Departamento de Matemáticas de la Universidad de Stanford en el periodo 2006-2007, profesor en la Escuela Central de París y autor de bestseller. Y ahora voy a hacer un, un comentario sobre un libro que tengo el honor de que él me lo, me lo firmó, que se llama Libera tu cerebro. All right, thank you very much. And uh, it's really an honor being here in, in your School of Engineering being able to present my works, but also my perspective on the collapse conjecture, and especially for, for the specialists around here. Uh, one first, modestly, uh, I may say, one first original contribution would be to blend the collapse and Furstenberg conjecture. Now, some of you are mathematicians. Uh, had you heard of the Furstenberg conjecture? You're in analysis, and yes, you had, right? And um, I may wager that it is the first time, it could be the first time that you saw the two conjectures together. Was it? That anybody saw those? The, because I'm quite positive that, uh, and it would be my modest contribution here, that the Collatz and Furstenberg conjecture had not been put together before. And uh, to be honest, the core of my work is to, to put them together and to show that one of their key mechanics is the same. And we're going to see why. But anyway, let's let's try to zoom out and uh, have a, a more simple perspective and ask very simple questions. So I've been introduced to you. Thank you so much. So I'm an international consultant. I was a visiting scholar at, at Stanford University. I was honored to be invited in 2006. That's quite some time ago uh, by Professor Solomon Pfefferman, the late Professor Solomon Pfefferman. As you will see, this conference is dedicated to him. And today I'm still a consultant and an author as well, and I, I do conferences. And just to show you before we start, another thing I do are uh, educational video games. Uh, this is my latest production. It's for mobile, so that's why the screen is small. And uh, it's, it's a video game to, to teach English at the moment, but actually we could teach pretty much anything with it. Uh, we're launching a mathematical version as I speak. We're preparing a version to teach mathematics. So it's some kind of Harry Potter duel. Uh, you, you fight a wizard, you have to reproduce those sentences really fast. And, uh, you know, you just do it under stress fast enough. It's called drilling. You know, when you repeat something fast under stress, it's called drilling. And if you, if you drill fast enough, you're going to launch a fireball at the enemy and you're going to deal them damage. You can see the, the small life bar over there. And uh, again, we're preparing a version for... Uh, mathematics education as well because if you can write it we can put it in the game definitely so we want to put case studies for mathematics as well and um, I'm really happy to put it at the disposal of the university whenever you want so uh, if you're in contact with the departments of uh, language learning say English but we could do French soon enough um, in France people asked us for Spanish specifically so we're preparing this one uh, I could really put it at the disposal of your university whenever you want I would be very proud of that uh, it took me quite some time to make this video game so I'm quite proud of it to be honest but uh, I wanted to show you what I was doing at the moment anyway let's go back to mathematics and uh, let's start with a very simple consideration okay Leopold Kronecker to be honest I don't like this man um, he was the worst enemy of my favorite mathematician. And my favorite mathematician was Georg Cantor, the, the father of set theory. And Georg Cantor actually uh, ended up in a psychiatric hospital because this guy was talking bad about him. I know it's, it's really terrible, but uh, Leopold Konecker said that Cantor was making, was doing terrible mathematics, that, that his work was not worth anything. Uh, and a few decades later, people would say that Cantor was one of the greatest mathematicians ever, which is true. But Konecker still, um, he had some, some kind of romantic vision about mathematics. And uh, the mathematicians in the room know that he had a dream that he called the dream of his youth. In, in German, it's called Liebster Jugendtraum. 
uh, El Sueño de Mi Juventud, uh, in Spanish, I, su I suppose. And um, you will see that what we will be studying today is quite linked to that. Of course, it's an immense mathematical problem that is unsolved. It's called the 12th Hilbert problem. But anyway, uh, for a very basic consideration, the idea of Konecker was that God made the integers, los números interos. Hmm? Uh, Dio creó a los números interos. Todos otros uh, son creaciones uh, de los hombres, se dice así. Okay. Um, it's quite funny to say it this way, right? Because integers, numeros interos. Why is it that we know so little about them today? I mean, they're very simple numbers. They're the simplest numbers you can make. Uh, and, and we will start the, the presentation with this consideration. I mean, we estimate that civilization, civilization has been around for 12,000 years. If you go back to Gobekli Tepe, possibly the oldest city known to man, it's not really a city, right? It's a settlement, but it's a, an archeological site in Turkey and it's 12,000 years old. And the reason I'm mentioning it is that to build it, you needed to know something about mathematics. You, you couldn't build Gobekli Tepe without having some knowledge of mathematics, even if it wasn't formal, even if it wasn't formalized, even if, if it wasn't clean, right? It could be just trial and error. But still, you couldn't build this, this uh, site without some consistent knowledge of some mathematics. So you could say that mathematics have been around for 12,000 years, um, even though it wasn't formalized, even though it wasn't written, because they didn't have writing at the time. But still, human beings have been doing mathematics for at least 12,000 years old. And we still know very little about integers, those numeros interos. We, there are so many basic, simple questions about them that are still open. For example, you know, is, is every integer the middle of a pair of primes? So if you, you take any number, any integer, do you still, do you always have two primes symmetric to it? It's called the Goldback conjecture. You, you could rephrase it, of course. You could phrase it as, is every, in, if, is every even integer the sum of two primes? This formulation is slightly less general, but still I prefer it this way because it's very geometric. Can you consider any integer the middle of two primes. It's almost equivalent to the Goldback conjecture there. It's just slightly less general. Uh, it's more ambitious in a way. But still, I mean, it's a very basic problem. Right? You take any number, can you always find two primes around it that are symmetric? We don't know. We have no idea about it. It's, it's 2023. We have no freaking idea about that. How come 12,000 years of mathematics, the first number system that was ever studied where the integers, actually the uh, numeros naturales, which are not the integers yet, but without negative numbers. But I mean, still, they're the longest studied numbers and we still can't answer this question, but it's not over, right? Are there infinitely many twin primes? So a twin prime is a pair of prime numbers where that are separated by two, right? 11 and 13, they are twin primes. Are there infinitely many of them? We don't know. We have Okay, the conjecture, the idea is that yes, there are, but nobody knows as I speak how to prove that. It's such a simple question. How come? Are there infinitely many Mersenne prime? Now, Marat Mersenne was a French mathematician. He was also a monk and he studied those, uh, he studied those primes, those numbers that can be written as a succession of ones in base two. And we have no idea whether you've got infinitely many of them. All we know so far for the professional mathematicians in the room is that it looks like uh, their frequency is log, log, right? This is what it looks like. But still, we have no idea how to prove that. Are there infinitely many Sophie Germain primes? Sophie Germain primes, they are those primes where if you add just one digit, one in base two, the, the, the other number is prime. So you take a number X, if you add one to it in base two, it's going to be prime as well. Those are Sophie Germain primes. They're they quite interesting. We have no idea whether we've got infinitely many of them. So I'm saying that for all the young people in the room because, and all the young people will listen online, um, we need fresh ideas. We need very fresh ideas about those problems because for 12,000 freaking years, we've not made much progress. We have made progress. It would be really uh, terrible to say we didn't, but mostly we haven't. And we will need fresh ideas to answer those questions. Now, the question we will be studying today is, Imagine you made a kind of labyrinth, right? In those 
natural numbers. You take every odd number, you multiply it by three, and you add one to it. So you make a labyrinth in the numbers. With arrows, you say you go this way, like as if you were in a city, right? You're in a street. And uh, in this street, you have to turn left or you turn right. Turning left is going to be multiplied by 3x plus 1, multiplied by 3 plus 1. And turning right would be divided by 2. Now, if the number is odd, you multiply it by 3 and you add 1. And if the number is even, you divide it by 2. And if you put those arrows on all the natural numbers, will you always go to 1? It's a very simple question. It's actually recent, though. Strangely enough, the Greek never asked such a question. Uh, it was called the Syracuse conjecture because it was asked at Syracuse University, but not in Italy, right? Not in Sicily, not Syracuse, Sicily, Syracuse, New York. So it's a recent question, which I find strange because it's very simple to ask. And the Greeks could have asked it. Actually, the Babylonians could have asked it. In fact, the Sumerians could have asked it because they understood multiplication. They understood division by two. So it could have been asked at least 5,000 years ago, but it wasn't. And it's freaking hard. Like, of course, uh, Paul Erdos, one of the most famous mathematicians, said mathematics may not be ready for this kind of problem. And um, he was quite right. But again, if we zoom out, why is it that after 12,000 years, we understand so little about natural numbers? I, I put integers because Kronecker said integers were created by God. But natural numbers, why is it that we understand so little about them even after 12,000 years? Now, what you're seeing here, this image, is what happens when you, you, you put the collapse labyrinth on numbers. So all those, uh, all those lines, this figure is called the collapse seaweed, right? Um, seaweed, I suppose in Espanol it's alga, right? Um, la alga de collapse, uh, because it looks like an algae underwater. Um, it's messy. Now, of course, in mathematics, in this case, you don't call it messy. You call it chaotic, caotico, hmm? or nalga caotica. Uh, but you could say it's a labyrinth, right? Labirinto, se dice así. So it looks like a labyrinth, right? It really looks like, you know, if you started somewhere, how could you know that it's going to one? And if I ask you, okay, you, you, you're starting from here. Will it go to one? Wow. We know it will because we did it by computer, but how could you prove that? And um, again, this is such a simple question, which is creating such a mess. Uh, how could you make something so complicated out of something so simple, which is the basic of chaos theory when you think about it? Okay, so this is the basic question we're trying to ask. Why, after 12,000 years, we, we still know so little about the simplest number system there is? And let's zoom out a little. Uh, you might have heard of this uh, this place, right? It's La, La Ciudad de Tikal. It's an amazing place because um, it's abandoned. It's a forsaken place now. It was proven very recently that one of the reasons it was abandoned is that uh, they got poisoned with mercury. Right? The, the civilization there, the Maya, because it was a Maya capital, a Maya city-state, an important city-state. Uh, they, they used paint with mercury in it. Of course, they did not know mercury was toxic. And um, there's a lot of rain, right? They, they don't call it the rainforest for nothing. So with all the rain, the mercury ended up in the uh, drinking water of the city. And um, it intoxicated the whole city. And according to this very recent publication in Nature, it was published in 2020. Um, one of the reasons for the collapse of the city was mercury poisoning. But there were other reasons. Um, soil depletion, you know, they were practicing agriculture at the rate that would deplete the soil. Now, why am I mentioning this city? Now, because all those pre-Columbian civilizations, and especially the Maya, they're interesting in that they missed entire continents of scientific knowledge. Now, they were very advanced, especially in astronomy, in some parts of mathematics, in architecture, in medicine. But they didn't have any metallurgy, right? Metallurgia, c'est dit c'est Well, the whole world of metallurgia, they missed. You know, they, they're an advanced civilization with an advanced religious system, with an advanced legal system, with an advanced philosophical system as well. 
and um, an advanced social order and uh, urbanism, pretty much everything. But they missed metallurgy. Okay. Some other pre-Columbian civilizations, they missed pottery. Okay, they were older than that, but uh, the civilization of Cajal, they didn't have any ceramics. They had large cities for their time. They had water systems and water, but they didn't have any ceramic. And when you think about that today, of course, we have a, a kind of global civilization. So we don't have means of comparison, right? The pre-Columbians, they were separated by an ocean. So they could remain by this process called vicariance. Um, I don't know if it's said like that in Spanish, vicariencia, quizás, vicariance. Okay, the name is vicariance. When you have, you know, a mountain separating uh, two species or two civilizations, so they evolve differently because you've got an obstacle. It could be an ocean, it could be a mountain. Well, when you've got an obstacle between civilizations, they evolve separately. And the pre-Columbian civilizations, they evolve separately from ours. And uh, they ended up missing stuff. Of course, here we are in Huelva, right next to where Cristobal Colón left to uh, uh, the Americas, which were named Americas after his arch rival, Amerigo Vespucci. But the question I want to ask from a mathematical perspective is, how do we know we're not like them? How do we know that after 12,000 years, we didn't miss something completely? These guys could, could work without metallurgy, almost no metal. They had some metallurgy for gold, but you know, gold is so easy to work. They didn't have steel, they didn't have bronze, and they could still have a very advanced civilization. And now how do we know that from a scientific perspective in mathematics, we, we didn't miss steel and bronze? We have no idea. How do we know that you know, when you're practicing mathematicians and you're, you're working as mathematicians, how do we know that our civilization didn't miss some like super essential aspects of the, of the, of the job just because we had no other civilization to show it to us or just be, because maybe we didn't explore it? How do we know we didn't miss that? Now, the whole point of my talk is going to be that we did and that there is a a world of mathematics that we're missing that, of course, I'm not bringing right away. I'm no genius there, but I just want to point in a direction that I suppose that I really consider we missed in mathematics. And this direction, from a technical point of view, they're called unary algebras. Now, again, all the professional mathematicians here are going to tell me, oh, unary algebras, they're so trivial. They're, they're trivial things. Right? So, okay, first off, what is a unary algebra? Let me go to the blackboard a little bit here. All right? And I explain those figures later. So, you know, binary algebras, they're simpler, right? Binary means this thing here is taking two inputs, right? That's very basic. When you do plus, when you use the symbol plus, you need two things. So it's binary. You need two things. The same when you need when you use this, the same when you use this, and then you, you know, you could go furthermore, and you could have more binary operators. But okay. This is the binary world. Binary algebras. They're very studied. I mean, they're so basic to our understanding of mathematics today. They're, their understanding is quite recent though, but Today, they're the most studied. Now, what is a unary algebra? Well, for example, there's this one. S of x equals two x, x, sorry, equals x plus one. It's actually the simplest one. It's called successor. Right? I suppose in Spanish you call it la operación sucesor. Okay. It's freaking basic, right? You can't make it more basic than that. You just add one to a number. Okay. So now that we understand each other, S of seven is what? Well, eight. Okay. But again, I really want to emphasize that this is so crazy simple. Now, why is it that being so simple it actually creates quite a mess. 
Giuseppe Peano, so he, he was a monk. Uh, he believed in God, which is quite important to his thinking. Um, I, I will submit to you in this presentation that one of the reasons, okay, I put the reason, that's quite cheeky. I'm going to tell you one of the reasons that the integers are so elusive today that they're still so complicated to understand is that unary algebras are way more complex than we thought. They are very simple objects and actually they, they can create a mess really fast, really fast. For example, piano arith arithmetic is probably the simplest model of arithmetic you could create. Those are the axioms of piano arithmetic. So, okay, zero is a number. The successor of any number is another number. There are no two numbers with the same successor. Quite important. What does it mean? Axiom number three. It means that piano arithmetic is a line, right? It's a line. This is forbidden. You can't have this, okay? You can't have this either. Now, in unary algebras, you could have trees, and we will study trees a lot because they're so important structures in the understanding of the, of the Collatz and Furstenberg conjecture. But in piano arithmetic, you're just making a line of numbers. And, I mean, you can't make it any more simple than that. Uh, that's why I'm so fascinated by it because, so for example, this is zero. This is the successor of zero, which is one. This is the successor of the successor of zero, which is two. And this is the successor of the successor of the successor of, sorry, of zero, which is three. All right. Again, very basic, very simple. It's a line. I mean, this is really child's play there. Zero cannot be the successor of anything. Okay, and axiom number five is what we call induction today. Um, I suppose in, in, in Spanish you say demonstración uh, con recurrencia or induction. So, induction, you say induction, okay. In, in English they say induction as well. Now in French they say recurrence. Uh, the axiom number five is the one that, that makes uh, induction possible. Okay, well you create such a simple system there, you expect that nothing strange will happen and actually, a lot of strange things happens to this system. Uh, this guy, Kurt Gödel, that uh, Time magazine said was the greatest mathematician of the 20th century. I think this is quite bombastic. Anyway, it doesn't make any sense to say who was the greatest of the 21st century, 20th century, but Time magazine said that. Just to tell you that if you've never heard his name, he's quite important. And of course, in logic, people know it's important. Now, Kurt Gödel demonstrated that this very simple system that Peano created is full of potential contradiction. And it's not even full of contradiction. In fact, it's, it's full of propositions you can't prove. It's full of things that you cannot prove. Now, how could a simple line, a simple system, a so simple could create such a mess? Now, the one contribution of, of Kurt Gödel, even though the method was probably the, the most important contribution, but from a philosophical point of view, Gödel demonstrated that with piano arithmetic, you can have huge problems really fast. And this system, though it's simple, is actually full of undecidable proposition. And any system that could, <clears throat> that could express piano arithmetic is actually full of undecidable propositions. So an undecidable proposition, let, let's take an example there. Uh, it's called Russell's paradox. It's a famous question that was asked way before Gödel. Okay, you take a set, the set of all sets that do not belong to themselves. All right, you know this because it's such a classic. So what is a set, what is a set that doesn't belong to itself? The set of pens is not a pen, so it doesn't belong to itself, right? The set of pens is going to be a mountain of pens, actually an infinite one, but it's going to be a mountain of pen. It's not going to be a pen, so it doesn't belong to itself. So if you take the set of all sets that have this property, the set of pens, the set of microphones, the set of iPads, and the set of spoons and cars, and you take the set of all sets that don't belong to themselves, and you ask the question, does it belong to itself? And if you do that, you have an unde undecidable proposition. Because if they do belong to themselves, 
then by definition, it's something that doesn't belong to themselves. And if it doesn't belong to itself, then by definition, it must belong to itself because it's the set of all sets that don't belong to itself. Let's make a diagram about that. So you have a set. Of course, you know, sets are represented by potatoes usually. And uh, in this set, you've got sets that don't belong to themselves. And again, if you ask that this belongs to itself, well, if it's in itself, then it must be out of itself because it's the set of all sets that don't belong to themselves. I will let you think it over or take a, take a sheet of paper to really uh, go over it. And uh, if it doesn't belong to itself, if say it's over there, then it must belong to itself because it's the set of all sets that belong to themselves. Okay, this is called Russell's paradox. For exhibiting such paradoxes, Russell got the Nobel Prize in Literature, of all, of all things, in the 50s, uh, because at the time he created, he discovered uh, those paradoxes, the Field Medal didn't exist, the Nobel Prize for Mathematics didn't exist, and you can only have the Field Medal if you're younger than 40. Actually, you need to be 40 the year they award it. So of all the young people here, start working. But the Field Medal is awarded if and only if you're 40 or less on the year that they awarded Bertrand Russell was way more than 40 when they created the Field Medal. So he got the Nobel Prize for Literature for making those discoveries. Oh, by the way, uh, when he discovered this paradox, um, one mathematic, mathi mathematician, actually a, a German logician, uh, got very upset. His name was uh, Gottlob Frege. And the Frege actually uh, apologized in a huge book that he had taken decades to write for the existence of this paradox. He really apologized, said, look, I'm sorry, my book is being published after decades and there's a paradox in it and I'm so sorry about it. To be honest, it's no big deal. The point is paradoxes, they happen quite often, especially in mathematics. But okay, let's go back. You know, back in the days, Peano, he thought, and many people thought that all the problem of philosophy was that our language was not precise enough. So being a monk, and being a mathematician, he figured that you should make language perfectly clear and that there should be no ambiguity. And you can't make a system less ambiguous than piano arithmetic. It's so simple, it's a line. There's no ambiguity in it. And still, with this simple unary algebra, you will end up with a mess real fast, like real, real fast. In fact, uh, so okay, Bertrand Russell, I, I, I mentioned it to you. Him to you, sorry. And uh, he wrote the Principia Mathematica, which made him famous for using 300 pages or more to prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2. So this was the idea at the time, making demonstrations perfectly um, rigorous and to make the demonstration that 1 plus 1 equals 2 perfectly rigorous at the time, you needed 300 pages. But today, in 2023, the idea that ambiguity is the main problem of philosophy is mainly false. One guy that got uh, that made himself a lot of enemies for proving that it wasn't really the problem was Jacques Derrida. Now Jacques Derrida, his philosophy is, is ambiguous everywhere. W whenever he writes any sentence, he writes you could you could take it ten different times, ten different ways. You could understand it ten different ways. And he was very proud of that. He put jokes in his philosophy. He put double entendre, triple entendre. Actually, you could really understand every sentence ten, maybe twelve different ways. And he was proud of that, but other philosophers at the time said that this was the opposite of philosophy. In fact, he was given a PhD by Cambridge University, an, an honorary PhD, and there was a protest. So you had like a protest of about 30 mathematicians and philosophers uh, protesting in times, uh, the London Times um, against his honorary PhD. And they were protesting outside Cambridge University saying he doesn't deserve his PhD because his language is too ambiguous. Among the people who protested uh, was immense mathematician René Tom, who got the Field Medal for his work on, on catastrophe theory. And uh, they were wrong. Uh, today, especially with artificial intelligence, there's a renewed interest in ambiguity because the way you program a good artificial intelligence is to be able to make it understand ambiguity. If you say something to your phone, 
the artificial intelligence must understand if you're speaking in English or, or Spanish in advance. You know, if I switch to another language, or se hablo italiano y mezclo las palabras, me pueden entender. Más o menos. Because ambiguity for the human brain, it's quite easy to, to, to figure out. Uh, you know, m my mobile phone with face recognition, if I yawn, how do you say yawn in Spanish? Uh, Bostezo, ok, se bostezo, mi camera no me reconoce uh, más. The, 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 the facial recognition of my phone, if I, if I open my mouth too much, it doesn't recognize me anymore. It's still hard today for artificial intelligences to understand what is my face, if I move it or if I smile too much, you know. On a, uh, that's why you're not allowed to smile on a passport picture. Right? Because if you smile, you increase the probability that the camera will not recognize you. So when you go to immigration in the United States, it's not only because they're assholes that they will make you, they, they will ask you not to smile. It's, uh, it's because it would actually mess up with the camera and mess up with the artificial intelligence. This is ambiguity. Ambiguity is a big challenge, actually. And uh, science today is more interested in ambiguity than it was at the time of, of Giuseppe Piano. We had this dream at the beginning of the 20th century that we could create a whole system that's completely perfect, that could prove anything, and that every word has a single uh, meaning. But, but it failed. It, it failed spectacularly. It failed beautifully, but it failed. But mathematicians know that already, but the point I want to, to underline for them is that uh, it failed because unary algebras are way more complex than we thought. And that very simple systems where you create a line with one single operation, they can mess up so fast that you'd be surprised really that they even hold, that, that they would even work in simple situations. So I mentioned God, integers, and ambiguity because uh, I put the, uh, I, I put the uh, atheist on the right. Jacques Derrida was an atheist, even though he said the idea of God was uh, very important in all my career. Bertrand Russell was an atheist, uh, like he was very adamant about it. And on the other side, Kurt Gödel, he actually, even though he was a logician, some people will tell you the best logician who ever lived, uh, he spent like a few weeks demonstrating the existence of God. So he wrote a, a demonstration of the existence of God. Now, Gödel was really a geek. Uh, if you put him any any system, any, any system of thought, he would find contradictions in it really fast. For example, he became a, a, an American citizen. And, uh, you know, he had to study the U.S. Constitution to get his citizenship. And after studying the U.S. Constitution, he found a few contradictions in it. So when he was asked, uh, you know, have you studied the, the, the Constitution? He said, yeah, maybe you should rewrite it because it has a few contradictions already. Well, I suppose today it's not bothering the Americans anymore. But still, this guy was really focused on finding contradictions everywhere. And he still believed there was a God and he made a whole demonstration that there was a God. So ambiguity and uh, transcendental concepts in philosophy, they, they've been linked quite a lot. Okay, I said unary algebras, they're way more complicated than we thought. Now, the reason that uh, we don't study unary algebras so much, I mean, again, for the professional mathematicians in this room, I'm quite sure that most of the time, if you had a PhD student coming with a project on unary algebras, of course, a more precise project, say I want to study some unary algebra in certain context, maybe outside of cryptography, I don't think you would be much interested. And even in cryptography, though, uh, usually you would use different structures to, um, uh, to, to try to address open questions. The reason binary algebras are, are so better studied and understood today is this gentleman, not alone, of course. But I mean, we really want to focus on him because uh, he was a shooting star, especially for young people in the room. He died when he was 20 and his way of thinking is still extremely fertile today. So he died in a duel in the 19th century, early 19th century. And he knew he would die because he ended up in a duel with someone who would win. And uh, he wrote his best friend, he takes a lot of courage to die at 20, which he did. And uh, before his duel, uh, he spent the night writing his theories about why you can't solve 
certain equations with radicals, especially the quintic equations, which had been studied by Ruffini, by Abel, and by Gauss. But Evariste Galois, that's his name. And again, I can't stress enough. Uh, in France, we have a long history of uh, shitting on our own geniuses. And I'm using the word shitting uh, really deliberately because uh, the top mathematicians of the time of Galois said his work was not worth anything. He was rejected from Ecole Polytechnique, which at the time was quite something. Today, it's not quite anymore, but at the time, it was really the most prestigious you could get there. And uh, he was rejected from Ecole Normale Supérieure as well, which is still today the most prestigious mathematical school in France. And uh, his peers said that his work was, uh, was not worth anything. And actually, it turns out his work was the, probably the best mathematical work of the 19th century, and it had a huge influence on all of mathematics. And of course, his work was credited with creating group theory as we know it, which is probably the most studied binary algebra groups are the binary algebraic structures, I suppose, that we've the most understood. Uh, so, so much so that recently we created a whole classification of simple groups. And it was a, a huge, uh, absolutely huge discovery in mathematics to make a complete classification of simple groups. It was as important as, say, um, uh, the uh, human genomics, understanding the human genome of mathematics, understanding all simple groups is probably even more important than understanding the human genome and understanding the human genome is quite an achievement. Okay, Evariste Galois died. Some will tell you that he was reincarnated. Uh, to be honest, I really think if reincarnation happened, this guy was Galois' reincarnation. Uh, he was the best French mathematician of the 20th century. He might have been completely crazy. Um, he ended up his life as an hermit in the Pyrenees, right, in the mountain. So he was disgusted with the world, academic life, everything. So uh, he started as this young, dashing man. And, uh, and then he, he ended up being a, really a hermit in, in, in the Pyrenees, actually. Uh, when he passed away, um, very few people knew about it. So the press figured it out, I think, a few months after he passed away. Now, Alexander Grotendieck, um, he was in his own world. He, you could say he created machines in a way, uh, intellectual machines. And uh, I would really say he's the heir of Evariste Galois. So if you're a Buddhist and you think, because, you know, in Buddhism, you're trying to find the reincarnation of certain masters, right? You, you've got monks, they're, they're really, their job at some point is to find the reincarnation of some master. I find it poetical. I'm not trying to push this idea here. That's not the subject of this conference. But if we wanted to be poetic and we're trying to find the reincarnation of Evariste Galois, for me, you would have to look into Alexander Grotendieck. In any case, the legacy, how do you say legacy in Spanish? Le legado? El legado. El legado de Evariste Galois uh, era immense. Uh, it was really huge. I mean, his way of thinking is still useful today in, in, uh, in very relevant ways. I mean, not only in applied mathematics, in abstract mathematics as well. For example, this guy, Paul Cohen. Now, when I was at Stanford University, I, I was very lucky to have my cubicle right in front of his office. And at the time, of course, he was emeritus. You, you didn't see him much often in the, uh, uh, around, the, around his office. But like right next door, I saw his name. And I really loved his work because he used the work of Galois. You wouldn't say that precisely, but his way of thinking was inspired by Galois in a very huge way. And he made an immense demonstration. Uh, which is that you cannot refute the continuum hypothesis in the standard set theory. And again, this was 100 years, more than 100 years after the death of Evariste Galois. And of course, you had Emmy Noether. You know, it's not affirmative action. She's an immense mathematician. I just, it's not because I wanted to put a female mathematician out of this uh, presentation, but of course, her work was profoundly influenced by Evariste Galois. Okay, so my point is binary algebra is there. They're like the air mathematicians breeze. I mean, I'm quite sure that um, working mathematicians in the room, you know, if I, t if I tell you binary algebras, you never call them this way, right? You never call them this way, do you? In your work. I mean, you would never, this word in a peer reviewed paper, you would never use it, would you? No, you would never use it because it's self evident. A group is a binary algebra, a ring is a binary algebra, a field is a binary algebra. It's really self-evident that 
most of the time when we're doing algebra, algebraic geometry, and all the possible applications, we're using binary structures. And um, because they're the most studied, they're the most understood, they're where we've got the most impressive theorems, fertile theorems. And you know, there's a famous joke. It's a Sufi joke. It's the joke of uh, Mullah Nasruddin. He's uh, lost his keys, so he's trying to find his keys under a street light. And uh, some friend of his comes and says, where did you lose your keys in the first place? He says, ah, I lost them in my home. So why do you search them under the street light? And he says, because here you've got more light. Sometimes we're trying to find solutions to problems where we have more, most light. And uh, definitely this guy, and of course others you couldn't, you know, it's not because I'm French that I'm trying to, to push the idea that group theory was invented only by a Frenchman, because it wasn't, right? Niels Abel, of course, and all the Scandinavians would hate me for saying otherwise. But the thing is, these guys, they created huge lights in mathematics. And those huge lights, they're binary algebras, and we just forget light is here. Right? We just realize light is not here when, when it's dark. But you wouldn't say, oh, there's light here. But you don't say we use binary algebras all the time, because you just do in mathematics. You could not do anything without them, but you would not put this, those two words, binary algebras, they're quite basic, they're quite strange sounding. But again, my point is, uh, using binary operators happens way more, like really way more, in fundamental mathematics today in uh, research than trying to obtain fundamental theorems on unary operators, especially not any unary operators, of course. I'm going to mention a few ones specifically. So, okay. If you understand that, you understand where I'm going. Uh, let's talk about chaos for a minute now. Because I told you with piano arithmetic, you could have contradictions really fast. Like really, really fast. You create a very simple system and it gets messed up before you even know it. And, and Gödel demonstrated that it was getting messed up really fast. And nobody expected it. Peano didn't expect it. Even Hilbert didn't expect it. Now, Hilbert is the best mathematician of his time. He didn't expect Peano arithmetic to be so messy, so fast. Now, in physics, we know of simple systems that are very messy, really fast, especially the double pendulum, right? You put a pendulum, ah, that's very easy to describe. But if you put another pendulum at the bottom of it, then the trajectories are completely messed up. Now, what you see here is what happens if you take four different pendulums, so double pendulums, one is the orange point, so that's the second point, right? And one is the green point, and one is the blue point, and one is this point, and this is what happens when you, they all start from almost the same position, and if you just, you know, have like a micrometer of difference between each of them, the trajectories will be completely different, and this is the definition of chaos. In mathematics, when you mention a chaotic system, the most accepted definition is critical dependence on initial conditions. What it means is that if you start from almost the same point, the trajectory is going to be completely messed up. Though, with a regular pendulum, you don't have that, right? A regular pendulum, you just start it a micrometer away, it's going to have the same behavior. But if you do that, you put another pendulum at the bottom, it messes up really fast. And actually, it messes up so fast, you could use it to encrypt messages. Now, there's a team recently that demonstrated that you could use double pendulums to encrypt messages. It was actually a strong form of encryption. Now, if you wanted to encrypt them really, really hard, you would do a triple pendulum or, or four pendulum or, or, you know, as many as you want. But you could really hide a message by putting the binary trajectory of a uh, double pendulum on top of it, and it would be quite a strong encryption. Of course, the authors, they're doing a little more than that, but... It's, part, it's called chaotic cryptology. Chaotic cryptology. Now, uh, if you want to go to applied mathematics, uh, it's a completely fertile field, I'd say, very promising field. That's the word I was looking for, promising. It's an extremely promising field, especially in the 21st century where you've got, you know, cryptos, bitcoins, and all that. Um, using chaotic systems to encrypt messages, uh, we've not done anything yet, I could say. If you want to write research on it, if you want to try things, if you want to patent things, you could patent new ways of, of encryption by using those, using chaotic systems to hide messages. It's extremely promising. It's now, this is leading me 
to the second conjecture of this uh, talk, the Fürstenberg conjecture. Let's have a very simple explanation of it, which I think analysts will find uh, interesting. So uh, you're an analyst, right? And you told me you, you had heard of the Fürstenberg conjecture, of course. Are you working on ergodic theory specifically? Okay, but you had heard of the Fürstenberg conjecture the same. Okay, this number looks like a completely random mess. Right? There's no message in this number. If you look at this number, there's no message. Now, when there's no message, you usually call it noise. This is noise. There's nothing in it. Right? Wrong. This message is actually this one. The number above is what happens if you represent in base 3 this number, which is a Mersenne number. Uh, this one is not prime, but it's a Mersenne number. Okay, so a Mersenne number is a number that you write only with once in base 2. If you, if you write it in base 3, it's going to output this mess. Now, how come? I mean, it's such a simple thing. You, you just try to convert one number to one base to another. And why is it so messy? Well, this is the entire Furstenberg conjecture. Now, it's usually stated different way, of course, but the core of the problem is that base two and base three representations have no common structure. And I'm going to tell you that the absolute core of the chaoticity of Collatz trajectories comes from that. Actually, this is not an opinion, it's a theorem I demonstrated with my team. The entirety of the chaoticity of Collatz orbits comes from this mess, this hard mess, because it, it's not a trivial mess. It's like a, a really messed up mess. So, okay, you've got this number in base two, you change it to base three, and it looks like it has no structure. By the way, you could use it for encryption as well. Base change, for example, imagine a simple system. Now, I'm not going to give you a whole recipe, of course. But imagine a simple system where you do that, you, you convert. So you have a message here, right? You have a message in binary, it's on your computer. Um, you convert it to base three, and then you turn every digit two in two digit ones. So it remains as long. Otherwise, you would have problems in terms of uh, vulnerabilities of your cipher. And then you iterate this process. And you would start, I don't say you have like a strong encryption yet, but you're going on the way of a strong encryption if you do this kind of thing. I didn't demonstrate it though. The guy who did was Hilen Fürstenberg. He actually worked. Uh, he actually worked on encryption. Now, very few people know that, but he did. The reason that few people know that is that his work of, on, on encryption was not quite published for reasons that you could imagine. Remember that um, the most used encryption algorithm today, RSA, was actually discovered way before uh, the inventors who were credited for it by uh, the British. Now, the British discovered it in the 70s, but it was secret. Uh, it was totally secret. It was classified. But today it's called RSA uh, because of the academics who published it first, but it was discovered before. Um, to be honest, look, I, I don't... Uh, I don't have access to uh, secrets of uh, the state that Hillel Fürstenberg worked for, but I'm quite sure that what I'm telling you about base change encryption has been used before and at a much more advanced level than what I'm mentioning. But still, I can tell you that mathematically speaking, very, very little has been published about it. And uh, whole careers could be made about it, how you could encrypt messages by using this kind of base change systems. Okay, so the two guys who have this perspective on the Fürstenberg conjecture are Hillel Fürstenberg, and Pablo Schmerkin. Pablo Schmerkin is an amazing mathematician. He works at the University of British Columbia. And uh, he's probably the man today uh, who knows most about the, the, the Fürstenberg conjecture, maybe along with uh, the few friends of uh, Arthur Avila, for example, in Brazil and France. But I think, you know, if the Fürstenberg conjecture was ever so, it could come from somebody close to Pablo Schmerkin, because in my opinion, he, he really got it right. And again, uh, they're the ones who put it the simplest possible way. I mean, the Fürstenberg conjecture is asking the problem that how could we predict base three from base two? And so many other things. Actually, it's not only base three and base two, it could be any base that is co-prime. Uh, but beyond that, it has many more applications. Okay, but let's mention chaos a little more. Uh, you've all heard of that, right? How do you call it in Spanish here? Ojale? 
or halde, right? In English, it's a puff pastry. In French, it's pâte feuilletée. Uh, we, we make the millefeuille with it, which the English call Napoleon. I suppose in Spanish, you don't call it Napoleon, right? You don't. <laughs> Right, you call it Milojas because Napoleon is not quite popular in Spain, right? So, uh, okay, but this is a chaotic system, like really fast. When you, it's called in mathematics, it's called the Baker's map. So, how do you make that to begin with? Like, how, how do you make that? You, you fold, you fold the dough, right? Repeatedly, and this is the repeatedly that makes it chaotic. So, why this is for real? I went to a website in French to get the recipe. And that's how it works, right? You put butter and then you fold and then you you um, um, flatten it again. And actually this is called the baker's map and it's really messed up as well. And uh, you could use it to encrypt messages as well, right? If you had like a binary number, like a, imagine an email, right? you put it in binary, you fold it, you intercalate the, the digits and you fold it again and you intercalate the digits and you do that again, you're gonna mess your message up really fast. And you're going to make it hard to predict really fast. Um, so simple things create chaos. And the Collins conjecture, of course, is very chaotic. Okay, um, in the Fürstenberg conjecture, it's all about studying what happens. So not exactly when you fold the dough, even though it's almost the same thing. But um, it's about, you know, what happens when you, you multiply a number by two. And then you do this mod one thing, which is you, you just cut whatever is after the point or whatever is on the left of the point, you just remove it, right? So it's studying what happens when you do times two mod one. So you just take the number after the point and you, you repeat it, right? And of course, the question is what happens if you do the same with three? And uh, that's all. I mean, it's, it's very, those are unary, by the way, right? It's, it's binary because you take a starting number, but it's a unary operation because your starting number is fixed. So you just do times two or times three, and it's a, it's a unary operation essentially, right? Because the first number is, is, is fixed. And uh, what happens when you do that is that you've got what are called invariant sets. Invariant sets. You've got sets, certain numbers, but if you repeat that, they will stay in the same set. They will never explore anything else. And those numbers, they're defined by what's called a Cantor set. Now, what's a Cantor set is you take a line from zero to one and you remove the middle, the middle third, and then you remove the middle third of the middle third, and then you, you keep doing that. Uh, it looks quite, uh, quite strange, but you, you could put it in a very simpler way. It's all the numbers that you cannot write with number one, with digit one in base three. So for example, this number, here is not in the counter set, right? It's got a lot of ones, so it's not in the counter set. Um, a number with only zeros and two, that's in the counter set. And that's the strict definition of the canonical counter set. That's how you call it. A number with no digits one in base three. Uh, of course, it was discovered by Georg Cantor, who was hated by Konecker. Today, I don't really understand why, but at the time. And the Georg Cantor, of course, invented set theory. His work is most amazing. David Hilbert said it was a paradise, right? We are today in Cantor's paradise. But for him, it was hell because he ended up in a psychiatric hospital because Konecker was talking shit about him, essentially. Sorry for using that word, but I want it to be remembered. Uh, now, Georg Cantor had other interests and uh, this structure would lead us to other more complicated structures. For example, this is called the Menger sponge. Um, it's quite interesting because, uh, you know, here, if you go to Wolfram Alpha, you could, you know, for your students, right? If you want to teach them about the Menger sponge, uh, you didn't use any pedagogical tool. You go to Wolfram Alpha and, and you can show that if you iterate, so you can understand the process here, right? You, you draw a hole in the middle and then you draw holes in the middles of the middle and then you keep doing that again and again. And if you keep doing that, what happens is that the volume goes to zero. The volume of the object goes to zero because it's made mostly of holes, but the surface goes to infinity. And uh, that's beautiful even in medicine, mind you. Um, if people have been intoxicated or they, they've taken some kind of poison, you know, 
people would prescribe you um, active carbon, right? Suppose in Spanish you say carbon activado, something like that. Carbon activado, se dice así. Now the reason carbon activado works is because it's almost a manger sponge. It has a huge surface for a very little volume because it's full of those holes. Because when you make carbon, when you when you burn wood, you create holes. You create a lot of holes. So what happens is that you increase the surface, and that's good if you want to to pick up the poison. You want a lot of water to go through those huge surfaces that will fix the poison, and that's why active carbon is is useful. So it's it's essentially mathematical. And here you see, in terms of origami, right? If you wanted, uh, because people, you know, okay, so some people have this kind of hobby of making origami manger sponges, and uh, this gives you the number of units you would need if you iterated, you know, after one level, you need 20, but then 400 and then 8,000. And it goes really fast because actually it's 20 to the end. Why am I mentioning that? Because you will see that my work on the Collatz conjecture is really linked to how fast those kind of origamis goes and how fast the unary algebras of the Collatz attractors will go. Okay. By the way, uh, this kind of uh, funny thing, an object that has zero volume, but infinite surface. It was known before, right? Um, there is the famous Gabriel horn, uh, which really has this shape. So how do you make it? You know, you, you take the, uh, you take the function one over X, right? You just take this one, for example, and you rotate it, right? You, you just take this segment and you rotate it. And that's all, it creates a trumpet. And, uh, well, this trumpet is known in mathematics. It's been known for quite a time, actually. It's been known from the uh, uh, 17th century, if, I me if memory serves, uh, to have a finite volume, but an infinite surface. So it's called the painter's paradox, because if you wanted to paint the outside, or actually the inside, it's the same surface. If you wanted to paint, uh, let's say, the outside of this uh, horn, you would need infinite paint. But if you wanted to feel the volume, you would not. You would only need pi, right? Depending on the radius. That this, this is the amount of paint you need to feel the trumpet. But this is the amount of paint you need to color the outside of the trumpet. So this is called Gabriel's horn. And it's so simple to make. By the way, you just rotate function 1 divided by x, right? The inverse of x. OK. Okay, that was the first popular part there. Uh, sorry for general audience, I made it a little technical, but the point was still to be as rigorous as possible, even though it's popular science so far. But now, as I told you, uh, my whole idea is that we like the Maya. We missed something in mathematics. They missed metallurgy, they missed uh, some aspect of agriculture, not all of them, but some aspects of them. They missed, um, well, of course, they didn't have, uh, you know, horses and uh, oxes, and they could do or they could make all this city with only llamas and, and very few animals that can be used to produce a lot of work. But they still managed. But my point is we missed something as well. And uh, I want just to show you a little glimpse into this something that I believed we missed. A kind of a different world. Now the team I had the, the chance of uh, directing produced this, uh, this figure. And this is a Collatz attractor. Now it's the first time it's represented this way. It's well behaved in a way. It's not, so well behaved is when you, you can understand chaos, right? Or chaos goes everywhere. but. When you manage to understand it in certain ways, mathematicians will say you've somehow well behaved it. Uh, this beautiful blue tornado is a figure that we produced two years ago. And it shows you Collatz trajectories in a new referential that is a multi-unary algebra. Uh, it's, it's not like piano arithmetic anymore, right? Uh, especially because now you could have branches. I told you in piano arithmetic, you can't have branches. Now you can have branches. And we're going to see that it's the whole point that you can have branches now. So you could call it a tree. Right? Trees are unary algebras. And after all, again, very few people would make their thesis in, in uh, you know, abstract mathematics. I'm not talking about applied mathematics, just on trees, right? or trying to get fundamental 
theorems on certain trees, yeah, that could lead you to some open questions in graph theory, but if you just took in mathematical publications, the word tree doesn't ap appear as much as the word group. If you take all the body of mathematical publications worldwide, the word tree will never appear as much as the word group or the word ring even, or the word field or whatever. All those binary algebras that are much better understood, even though a lot of them are not understood, right? The field of um, real numbers is still a mess for us and it's still super hard to understand. But okay, w what is this? If you rotate it, this is what it looks like. This is the trajectory of a special number. It's a Mersenne number. In uh, here. So it's uh, number 127. So being a Mersenne number, you could write it with only digits 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And uh, the trajectory of this number is in green. Actually, it was in yellow. Blue is the trajectory of all the numbers that lead to 1. So it's the attractor of 1. The attractor of 1 is in blue. The attractor of 127 is in yellow, and since they belong to the same, it appears in green. Now, this kind of thing we demonstrated could be used in cryptography as well. You could scan it as a QR code to make a proof of works. Um, we didn't, this idea didn't come uh, spontaneously in my head. I inspired myself from the works of Fabian Bocart, uh, an independent researcher who worked on, on uh, Bitcoin and, and proofs of work for, for cryptocurrencies. And he, he published in 2018 that you could use the Collatz conjecture to create a new proof of work stronger than the proof of work used for Bitcoin and more efficient. So I said, oh, that's quite interesting. So let's see if we could make other proofs of work and if we could make them scannable, you would just use a camera and say, oh, it, it works. Uh, and it does. And you see, there's no way you can falsify that. Um, it's like a barcode, right? All those lines, uh, good luck for falsifying it. But of course you would need to do it for much larger numbers. I won't go too much in, in details of that. but. This figure, this stuff, what is it? What the hell is this? Uh, well, we studied it. So um, we called it a dream catcher because, you know, it looks like those figures by the, I think it's the Lenape people, right? Or Anashinka, I think the Anashinka Indians, not Indians, American natives, let's put the right word. And uh, the Anashinka, they would have those um, artifacts they put over your bed. Well, it's not bad for them, but like to catch your bad dreams. And they're called dream catchers. And I, I found the structure had a similar look to it. So I called it a dream catcher. And also because Konecker had this Lipster Jugend problem. And in fact, you could see that these, these structures could be quite interesting in understanding complex multiplication. But okay, what are they? That's where I try to give you a glimpse in my word, uh, world, sorry. Um, what I think we missed. And what I think we missed is this. Not only, right, but those figures, I think, are among the things we missed. And I'm sorry here, we're going to get more technical. Um, so the professional mathematicians in the room have heard about prefer groups. Prefer, I pr pronounce them this way, prefer groups. Um, they're the roots of unity, right? So they're groups of the roots of unity. If you map numbers on a prefer group, which is what we did here, the prefer groups are really cool things. Uh, you teach, I suppose, right? Do you teach? Can I ask you if you teach math? Yeah. Um, you know, they're used usually as an example if you want to, to tell someone that not every Artinian group is Noetherian. You mentioned prefer groups because they are the archetype, archetype of a group that is Artinian but not Noetherian. Anyway, if you map numbers on those groups, this is what you get. So I put numbers in base two. Each color is a different residue class, right? So numbers in blue are divisible by three. Uh, number in uh, orange, they've got a residue of one in base three. And uh, number in green, they've got a residue of two in base three. Oh, let, me, let me check. <laughs> Actually, maybe I said, no, that's the opposite, right? Number if green have a residue of, no, that's right, in, of one. And these have a residue of two. Okay. So you put them on the circle. So you just go around the circle. That, that, that's the way you do it. Uh, the first is like a line. 
So for all numbers that you can write with one or two character, with one or two digits, and then you turn around like that, five, seven. Okay, that's gonna make a line. And then this is gonna make a square, nine, 11, 13, and 15. All right, so this is a square. Let me make it clean here. Like that. Okay, and then you keep going on and you're gonna have a, uh, you're gonna have an octagon and, and, and this and that. And uh, you're gonna have uh, figures with two to the end sides. And that's how you map the numbers, okay? Now, what do the blue lines represent? The blue lines represents the multiplication by three. If you multiply one by three, of course, there's no blue line here because it's just the diameter, right? But if you multiply five by three, you've got 15. And what you see is that, so it's called the envelope, the central figure, it's called the envelope of it. And the envelope is a peculiar figure. Uh, those kind of figure happen, actually algebraists know them. And uh, we figured quite fast that it was the intersection of two algebraic varieties of a genus, oh, sorry, in English you said genus, genus, no, not genus, you say order, right? Of order um, six and eight. So this heart shape here is this stuff, the two, the, the, two, uh, the blue curve, the blue variety and uh, the orange variety that's truncated at the top. This is what happens when you multiply a base two representation by three. Now, why does this matter? Because we try to understand this, remember? We try to understand that. And again, I will humbly submit to you that we were the first team to put together that this problem is the core of the collapse problem as well. This problem is the core of the Furstenberg problem. And that's what Furstenberg and Schmerkin understood. But this problem is also the core of the collapse problem. And now when you try to represent what happens to a base two representation, because you understand that every base two representation here has a single point on the, on the circle. I mean, only for odd numbers. If you put even numbers, they will be at the same place. But if you put only odd numbers, they will have a single place on the circle. And now you understand exactly what happens to the base two representation when you multiply it by three. I mean, it, it's clear, even though it's bizarre, but it's clear. You've got one figure and the equation of that figure is this. And it's, uh, it's perfectly, I wouldn't say understood, but it's perfectly formulated. By the way, um, I'm going to put forward a technical conjecture here for the uh, people interested in the Furstenberg conjecture and the Kohlhaas conjecture. Hidel Furstenberg proved that you've got no invariant contour set under both the times two times three maps, mod one. He proved that. That's one of his most famous theorems, actually. He demonstrated that you have invariant sets in base two uh, for multiplication by two. Sorry, you have invariant sets for multiplication by three. But if you mix the two, you don't. And there's a reason for that, which is that when you mix multiplications by two and three, you mix the numbers. Like it's a little bit like this. It's, it's, I'm, I'm putting it intuitively here, right? This is not a rigorous demonstration, but it's a little bit like this. If you were folding and, and flattening and folding and flattening again, you would mix the dough, right? Actually it's used, it's used in, uh, you know, by blacksmiths, right? When you're making Damascus steel, this is what you're doing. When, when you're making, uh, when, when the Japanese were making their swords, they would use that as well to extract the uh, um, impurities out of the, the metal, right? So it mixes quite well. But the point is when you use operation times two and operation times three at the same time, this is what happens as well. You mix numbers. And this is only a conjecture I'm putting here, but I'm quite sure that somebody smart enough will find a way to demonstrate that with only the first Sternberg theorem, that times two and times three are mixing, they don't have invariant sets. Uh, you could prove that there are no non-trivial cycles in collats alone. Just this, just, just this result, which is a huge result already. Okay, so you remember Collad's uh, attractors, they, they are messed up. I mean, before we came, it looked like this. And uh, after we came, 
but it still look messed up. But now you've got you've got something more. I mean, you've got an object at the center that that explains you why it's messing up a little bit. And again, I mean, from this object, where I don't see any property you could find, or any equation you could find, or any geometry you could find, uh, suddenly you've got this object, and it's still messed up, make no mistake, but, I mean, modestly, I'm going to tell you that this is slightly better. And uh, especially when you put it this way, when you put it in the binary tree. And this is the world I'm trying to take you in. But again, this is the most technical part and I'm trying to present the original part of my works. So I couldn't put it any other way and I apologize for that. But try and uh, hear me out on this one. This multi-unary algebra uh, is different than piano arithmetic, no doubt. But it's still simple, right? It's a binary tree where you also put the ternary tree on top. So this is the ternary tree. So each number, you can go right either on the left, it's multiplied by 3 minus 2, or you go on top, like here. So if you go this way in this tree, you do multiplication by 3 minus 2, and here you do multiplication by 3, and here you do multiplication by 3 plus 2, right? So as it turns out, this will have a residue 1 in base 3, and this will have a residue 2 in base 3. OK? And this will have, of course, a residue 0, because it's divisible by 3. Now you're trying to encapsulate these properties of the base 3 representation in the binary tree. This is what you're trying to do. You're trying to represent when you do this time. So this is the binary tree, meaning that uh, Either you do times 2 minus 1, or you do times 2 plus 1, OK? And I don't represent even numbers, because in Colette, you know what happens to even numbers. So you don't really need to represent them. And uh, for example, the moment you put Colette this way, a lot of things become clearer. I don't say you solve it, but a lot of things become like more understandable. It, it's not this anymore, because the challenge was really to go away from this. This is beautiful, this is inspiring, but this is messy, and we there's no way we can grasp it. Actually, you could put it this other way as well. It's still messy, it's still challenging, it looks like blood, it looks like blood vessels. Actually, there are a lot of uh, behaviors in, in morphogenesis in the human body, not only in the human body, in the body of animals in general, not in vegetables most of the time, but a lot of, uh, because in, you know, in vegetables, cells don't move, right? That's one important thing. Cells don't migrate in vegetables. Um, this is one of the f f founding features of vegetables compared to uh, animals. And uh, in animals, the embryo, the cells move. And the reason that this is important is that by moving, uh, the cells can create very complex patterns like a leopard, for example, or the stripes of a zebra or with so many other things that follow, in this case, Turing patterns. Turing patterns would be followed for some seashells. In any case, chaos happens a lot um, in, in uh, embryos. That's why it looks like blood, in a way. I wouldn't say that's why, but it's not surprising that this looks like blood vessels, even though we're talking about numbers, because chaos happens a lot in biology, especially with animals, because their cells move. OK, so we're trying to go from this mess to something that is less of a mess. So these are the Mersenne numbers here, right? This line, OK. And this line, what happens to it when you collapse it is that it will go first here, then it will go first second here, then it will go here, then here, then here. OK, this is making it ugly, so I'm going to erase it. But what you're seeing is that this is spiraling, right? which is normal because there's a multiplication by 3. And the multiplication by 3 spirals around the base 2 representation. So let me remove those to make it cleaner now. This branch goes to this branch, and then this one, and then this one, and this one. 
and this one, etc. So there's a theorem actually, which is that if you have a number in the Collins conjecture that you can write like that, it will be mapped like that. in base three. So this is in base two, this is in base three. If a number has a tail of digit one, it will be mapped to a number that has the same tail, but of digit two in base three. So in collats, you've got base change. And it's not like you got base change incidentally. It's you've got base change at the core of it, like really the center of the collapse conjecture, the collapse dynamical system is a problem of base change. And you could prove it. I mean, if you got calculators on your phone and uh, you would follow the trajectory of 31, which is a Mersenne number. So I always forgot it's two to the five, right? So it's, uh, I suppose, I don't remember it's five digits or, or more. But if you follow 31, it will lead you to this number in base three. Now this number is quite easy to find. You take this, right? So I suppose now then 31 must be four digits. Oh, no. uh, and it, this is the trajectory of 31, okay? 31 goes here. So by the way, uh, what I'm showing you is that we demonstrated that as well. You could compress collapse orbits, not compress them perfectly, but some of them you could say, oh, you're going directly there. So you don't have to do all the steps. You say this number has six digits ones in the end. It can go directly to this number with six digits two in the end. And this is useful still. I mean, you, you really compress it. For example, if you're trying to optimize um, some computation about it, it's a really useful compression algorithm. By the way, why is it chaotic? Now, remember chaos is when you, if you move a little bit, you change completely the dynamic of it. Um, 31 is going to be increasing. It goes to this. But if you take 33, this one, well, 33 is going down. And there's a reason to that, which is that while 31 is written like that, well, I'm going to put another number here. You've got numbers that are written like that, right? Well, there's a theorem. These ones go down, these ones go up for as long as they've got those zeros. So, a number that has a tail of digits ones in base two, it's going to go up in collapse until it doesn't. And a number that has a sandwich of zeros in base two is going to go down. It's not so hard to demonstrate, but it's really practical for many, many aspects. And you understand it much better. That's why I wanted to tell you about, especially arithmetic topology. No, I want to make a uh, technical point on that. Uh, the professionals know arithmetic topology usually with knots and possibly braids as well, but much less, but knots, right? In arithmetic topology, you would use knots as a representation of prime ideals, and you would use links as a representation of ideals. But it's not only about that. I mean, to me, this is arithmetic topology in the same way, because you're, you're trying to create, or you could call it arithmetic geometry, by the way, but you're trying to create an arithmetic structure that will allow you to prove things and to prove things much more easily. And uh, then, of course, you prove them with algebra, but putting it this way allows you to prove it much, much simpler. So, okay, this is the world that I was trying to introduce here. Those are unary algebras, multi-unary algebras, because what is this tree if you put it in an algebraic way? This tree is number one plus operation 2x minus one, operation 2x plus 1, then operation 3x plus 2, operation 3x minus 2, and operations 3x. So it's very much multi-unary. 
And it's redundant because operations in three will lead you to the same things as operations in two, just in a different way. The path will be different. So this is a multi, multi, sorry in English, multi-unary algebra. And pretty much the technical part of my talk, the one that we're in the thick of it now, is all about the fact that we should study them much more. That people should get grants to study them, that labs should study them much more, that people should do PhD thesis on them because multi-unary algebras, they can lead you the same way that piano arithmetic could lead you to crazy properties. Multi-unary algebras could lead you to crazy properties as well that are useful to understand chaos. And this is what I did in my work. I created a new multi-unary algebra to define collapse basins. So I'm just, yeah, sorry guys, right? Uh, but for the technical part here, uh, there's the reference. You've got my papers and you can check them out. This is a collapse basin. So let's work through it together. You do one operation, which is a of x equals 2x minus 1 divided by 3. Then you do c of x, which is 4x minus 1 divided by 3, and v of x, which is 4x plus 1. Okay, let's try to understand what we're talking about here. You see, for example, if I do v of x, this is v of x, right? Four times one plus one is five. And if I keep going like that, well, all those numbers, they've got a very special property. If you take them like that, which is that they will all go to a power of two. If you do three times five plus one, it's going to give you 16. If you do 3 times 21 plus 1, it's going to give you 64. And if you do 3 times 85 plus 1, it's going to give you the second even power of 2. Pure. And it goes straight to 1. Why? Well, it happens for all the vertical lines. I mean, if you take this vertical line here, it's going to lead you to powers of 2 of 5. The trajectory of 3, which is 5. So, the image of this line by Colatz is all the numbers here, the odd numbers here that are not represented, the even numbers here that are not represented, right? All those numbers here. They're being mapped by this one. This is what V of X does. So again, let's get this intuition as well with a calculator. Uh, you do, I'm going to do it like right now, old school with my calculator. You do 13 times 3 plus 1, it's going to give you 40, right? And what happens if you do this? It's going to give you 10. Now I understand very much that this is 4 times the bottom of it. Okay, so this is why operation, and I'm going to delete that again, this is why operation V of X is important. Now let's try to understand the other operations because they are quite important as well. And they're part of the multi-unary algebra that I created. C of X is essentially, you take an orange number, sorry, you take a, you take a green number like this. And you, it leads you to the number that will lead to it under the Colette's map. So C of X is going to lead you to uh, 9. Yeah, 9. Because, let's do it again very naively, 3 times 9 plus 1. All right. And 28 is here. So 
So C of X, so by the way, I forgot to put a technical aspect here, which is of course, if X ends with one in base three, and if X ends with two in base three. That's why I said you need to take a green number. So what we're trying to do here is reverse collets. We're trying to, to take this like crazy algae we have here, and we're trying to find why it goes this way. And the reason it goes this way is the multiplication by three over the binary tree, which messes up things really fast. And which, as I told you from a technical perspective, Furstenberg demonstrated that it mixes the numbers so well that you can't have an invariant Cantor set for it when you mix three and two. So we're trying to understand why it goes this way. So by reversing it, we introduce those three operations a of x equals 2x minus 1 divided by 3, c of x equals 4x minus 1 divided by 3, and v of x equals 4x plus 1. Now I put the demonstration here proving that this is the entire collapse basin of any number, that the closure, the multi-unary algebra of any odd number, odd, it needs to be odd, by those three operations is going to be the full basin of this number. There is no number that leads to x that is not in it. Well, I can walk, walk you through the demonstration quite fast. The reason it works is that if 3x plus 1 is divisible exactly by 2, then you can use only a of x. If it's divisible exactly by 4, then you can use only c of x. And if it's divisible by anything different than 4 or 2, 8 or more, then you could use a word made of v, then c and a all the time. So, okay, now we have collapse basins. And again, they're like the first and back conjecture. You, you're mixing things with, with times two times three, and you're obtaining complex things. They're hard things, those collet spaces. They're not easy things. They seem simple, but I mean, they, you understand that if piano arithmetic can mess up real fast, this will mess up much faster because you've got conditions and you've got modulos, uh, moduli and stuff. Okay. So now, you could say that all the numbers leading to a number in the collapse conjecture are all the legal words that you could that you could make with a, c, and v. This is what they look like. Now, a friend of mine, uh, Philippe Anel, made a small piece of software that shows you what it looks like, and you will understand why it's it's messing up real fast. Uh, here, you've got the vertical series of one, right? One, five, etc. And I can click on any number and it will do one operation on it. So if it's a, sorry, the colors change. If it's a number divisible by three, for example, you can only do V. So it creates the V line here, right? But you see, for example, on those numbers, there's a line on the side. And that's because on this number, we did operation C, right? And operation C gave us that number. Now, if I click this number, it's going to give me its operation A plus its vertical line. Okay, uh, we could make it into a game. Okay, um, maybe I have no life and I would find it funny. I'm quite sure you wouldn't find it funny, but some people find Sudoku funny. Now, if I, we created a rule that if you play this game, the rule would be that you have to stay on the bottom as much as you can, right? The moment you reach the top, you're dead. Okay, so you have to pick up dots and uh, if you reach the top, you're dead. Uh, you could play like that and you try to stay on the bottom as much as you, as you can. Uh, by the way, this is so messed up yet again that you could use it for cryptography very much because now this multi-unary algebra is going to screw you up real fast. Which is the point, right? Again, if piano arithmetic can create so many problems real fast, this will create even more problems faster. But look at that. Like some crazy subway map. So again, I thank Philippe Anel, my friend, for, for programming this. And uh, the whole question of my work was how many numbers do you have in that when you go wh when when there is no top? Right. So the top is how long you can write the number right, in base two. So here we put a top because we're just on a computer. We can't go to infinity. But the whole point of my work is what happens if there is no top? If the length of the number can go to infinity. Uh, what we did here was only explore a few possibilities of the collatz basin, the collatz attractor, because uh, 
whenever I'm clicking on a number here on the bottom, you understand that I'm not clicking on these ones, right? Here, I could have clicked on this one, creates a new path. Here, I click on this one, but I could have clicked on this one. So I've got a new path all the time. Actually, I don't have a new path. I have an infinite series of new paths. Now, operation V, you understand it adds two binary digits. Two, because it's four times plus one. Operation C, it adds four-thirds of a digit. And operation A removes uh, two-thirds of a digit. Operation A is decreasing. You see operation A, you see the line is going down, right? It will not always go down because, as you know, de depending on where you are on the binary tree, if you do two-thirds, you will still have the same length of the number. So here, the line is straight, but here, the line is going down. But operation A is decreasing, operation C is increasing, operation V is increasing very much, two digits, four times. Okay, for the technical part, my whole work has been about finding how many points you have in this when n goes to infinity. And uh, I'm not going to go through the demonstration here because you've been patient enough. It was hard for me, of course, to make a talk of popular science that would have a second part that would try to be as technical as possible without killing all of you. Uh, not all, obviously. But that's the question. What happens to those collapsed basins when n goes to infinity? So first off, what we found, we, we just used the computer and uh, we were like, okay, uh, please. You do the basin of one, so you do the ACV closure, you do the multi-unary multi algebra of one, and you try to understand if it gets all the numbers. Well, it does. As far as you go, it does. Uh, what you're finding here is uh, all the extra numbers proven above a certain line of the tree. Let me explain. What we do is we do the ACV closure of one, and then we say, okay, let's note when all the numbers here have been done, how many numbers above are being proven as well, have uh, been reached by the attract as well? And we note them. Then we keep going, say, okay, uh, wh once we reach here, what happens? What we reach here, what happens? Okay? And th this is what it represents. So let me erase that. So when we reach with all the numbers, all the odd numbers with two digits have been reached, you've got so many new numbers that have been reached as well by the attractor on top. And when all the numbers with three digits have been proven, you've got so many numbers on top. And when all the numbers with four digits, you've got so many numbers on top. And this is the, the line you get. It follows three to the n plus one really well. Uh, when, now at the time, we didn't call it the ACV closure. We called it the golden automaton. We had an understanding of it that was more complex. But anyway, um, when you do this multi-unary algebra on one, it will cut the tree, it will prove all of them. As far as we tested it on the computer, it's not a demonstration yet. And every time, the extra numbers that, that have been proven above it, they're in the range of 3 to the n plus 1. Actually, they never exceed 3 to the n plus 1, so we suspect that they're 3 to the n something. Okay, that's a new result. It was applied mathematics. We wanted to prove something about cryptography and how we could use the collapse conjecture for proofs of works, and then suddenly we started having this. So then we went further. And what we did was trying to obtain some theorems. Now again, I will not, this won't be the purpose of this talk, to explain how we got that. Right? In, this, in that case, this publication was uh, individual. This is an extension I made myself. But I had the honor of, of directing a team, German and French team, to make this one because the access to supercomputers, especially in Strasbourg, I didn't have. And. Uh, well, the theorem I obtained was that basically if you push the length of the numbers you can write in the ACV closure of any odd number to infinity, it's going to reach 2 to the n, where n is the length. Uh, I think you're starting to get why it could be an important result. What it means is that if we make an abstract representation of the binary tree here, like that, this cone, if you will. What we're meaning is that the numbers you get in this, of course, in the binary tree, they're in the range of 2 to the n, because the numbers of odd numbers that you can write with n digits is 2 to the n. 
follows to, to the end. Not to, to the end plus one, because you're talking about odd numbers only. But now you're talking about the attractor of a certain number. So you take a number here, and I'm going to put it in a different color. For example, this one. And you're not doing the binary, dig the binary tree of it anymore. You're doing the ACV closure of it. So you're doing the basin of it. And this is going to be a seaweed. This is going to be this messed up shape that people don't understand. But this messed up shape has some limit properties. And those limit properties are, when n goes to infinity, this will follow 2 to the n, plus some constant. And it goes for any number, including 1. So now, what does it mean? Of course, for the case of 1, it doesn't mean that you've solved the coalesce conjecture yet, because all it means is that if you're trying to do on the binary tree here, so the binary tree is represented in white, and this is 1 here. And then you do, in teal, you do You do this. And this is the ACV. But what we got is that the limit of the ACV of 1 divided by 2 to the n. It's going to be, sorry, it's going to be 1, not 0, 1. Now, it still means that you could have infinitely many numbers that don't co converge to 1, but at least you're going to have a set, though infinite, this one, okay? Well, this one divided by this one is going to be 0. Okay. Well, again, modestly, and this is what I'm claiming, uh, this is a result that's <coughs> equivalent to the one obtained by Tau, actually, and again, forga forgive my being uh, maybe lacking modesty there, but this is a result that's actually strictly stronger than that of Tao because so Terence Tao made a uh, strong discovery on the Connett's conjecture uh, four years ago. The reason it's stronger is because for Tao, it was almost all numbers have almost bounded trajectories. Here we have that almost all numbers have bounded trajectories, not almost bounded, bounded. So again, and I'm going to completely... Uh, uh, assume this statement, not assume. Assume is not the right word. Assume is in French. Uh, I'm making this statement in good faith here. Tau says almost all collapse orbits attain almost bounded value. What we do first is remove that. So multi-unary algebras, they're quite interesting. But there's another statement we're making and that I'm going to conclude on, which is that first off, when you do the ACV of 1, you're going to cover almost all of the binary tree. Okay. But what we're saying as well is that when you do the ACV of any number x here, you will reach something to the extent of 2 to the n new numbers that are in the attractor of x. The final statement we made in our last paper is that this will be superior strictly to that part. Because from an analytical perspective, no collapse attractor vanishes. And this is a theorem we have.
meaning that there is no ACV of X such that Of course, this is the theorem that I'm claiming at the end of that paper. So, again, thank you for your patience. I just wanted to go back to simpler stuff if we could. One of the reasons I'm making this talk for a professional working mathematician audience is that I'm quite sure that you could prove that the ACV closure of any odd number is going to the range of 2 to the n in many different ways. I mentioned you that we should study multi-unary algebras. Maybe we should name them differently. We could call them some trees or some intersection of trees because you understood that the one I made here, and that's why I didn't call it only a tree, it's an intersection of two trees. So an intersection of two trees or a multi-unary algebra, we should find another name to make it you know, simpler to use and simpler to call and simpler to study. After all, a group is simple, right? A set of permutations, when it was first discovered, sets didn't exist yet. But you know, you should make mathematical objects as simple as possible in their name. Their name should be short. It's always good to make the name short. And uh, studying those intersections of trees, it gives you, to me, a new field, which is not entirely new, which you could study from the perspective of algebraic geometry or from the perspective of arithmetic topology, not going through knots, but braids, you know. And uh, because you've got some kind of braids in a way, if, if you showed the way that the ternary tree goes to the binary tree, you've got some kind of braids. And braids are studied with groups and uh, they're well behaved in a way. But my point is, if we study multi-unary algebras, we're gonna come up with fundamental theorems. And the fundamental theorem is usually proven in many different ways. Now, of course, I claim, and my articles were peer-reviewed, but anything can happen, but I claim that I demonstrated that the limit number of elements in this multi-unary algebra, this one, if you keep playing and you push all the buttons to infinity, it's gonna be two to the n. What I'm claiming for you now working mathematicians or you, working mathematicians, future working mathematicians, is that this is a fundamental theorem of the type of multi-unary algebras that I showed up, and that you could prove it in many other ways, like really many other ways. Let's explore just one of them. When you are doing, you know, we're considering all the legal ACV words. This is what we're doing, all the legal ACV words. But we have a few uh, we have a few topological theorems. You could prove this, those invariants. If you note cursive V as all the numbers of V characters in your set and cursive A and cursive C, you, you will have these invariants. And you will also have these invariants here. There will be as many A's as, uh, as C's in your set when N goes to infinity. It's not so hard to prove. We'll have as many as them of them. Okay. So with those invariants, you could go another way, which is not the way I used in my paper. I used a purely algebraic way, which was slightly technical, though of course for working mathematicians should be no burden, as it wasn't for the reviewers, hopefully. But I'm quite sure you could find a more elegant proof of that. And the direction I want to put at the end of this talk is going with the Sierpinski triangle. Now, it remains still in an undergrad level of mathematics, but it's still an undergraduate level of mathematics, and I apologize for that. Uh, the Hausdorff dimension of the Cantor set is going to be log two divided by log three, which is one divided by the Hausdorff dimension 
of the Sierpinski triangle. Which is, of course, log 3 divided by log 2. The Sierpinski triangle can map to a ternary tree. Now, what you're doing here is that you could say that 2 to the n, it's not you could say, you could see 2 to the n as 3 to the log 2, log 3, which is absolutely the same thing. So you could say that she will not, not really the cardinal, but the number of elements, okay? Uh, is like a ternary tree of which you're cutting branches and you're cutting branches at the rate of the cantor set. And the way you're minimizing or scaling or deforming the ternary tree is exactly that of the cantor set. That would give you this result, but it would give it to you in a much more elegant way than the one I tried and claim I succeeded. So I wanted to finish the technical part on this. To me, we need fundamental theorems on multi-unary algebras. We need them, and the reason we need them is because we still don't know so much about integers. And integers, they can be understood with multi-unary algebras in a very different way. I don't say, of course, that group theory and ring theory especially will not help, but multi-unary algebras is made for integers. It really works when you understand them this way. And that's why there is arithmetic topology, because it uses primes and it represents them as lots, and it uses prime ideals, sorry, prime ideals and ideals are represented as, as links. And it's exactly the same strategy we're doing here by mixing trees there. And this is a multi-unary algebra, but you could see it as a geometry. The reason we need to study multi-unary algebra is there is a whole world, a whole continent, in the same way that Cristobal Colon didn't know at the time there was a new continent over there. There's a new continent in mathematics beyond this ocean of multi-unary algebra. I don't mean multi-unary algebras are the continent. I mean they are the ocean. If we cross it, we're going to find new objects. And I'm, I'm talking about new crazy objects. And we need to study them. But to begin with, of course, to cross the ocean, well, we need to prepare La Nina and La Pinta. And La Nina and La Pinta will be fundamental theorems. We need basic theorems that are fundamental about multi-unary algebras. I claim I found one by studying Collatz basins. I claim this strategy can be expanded way more, way beyond what I did. And I claim that once we have those fundamental theorems on multi-unary algebras, there will be a new continent that I have no idea about that will help us understand integers in a completely different ways. And this is the contribution I tried to make in this talk. So before I finish it, I really want, of course, to thank many people, uh, including my mother, obviously, but I wanted to add those mathematicians who inspired me or helped me. I was invited at Stanford University by Solomon Pfefferman, who was a logician. He worked with Alfred Tarski, who actually was the editor of the com collected works of Alfred Tarski. And, uh, one of the subjects of my uh, investigation when I was invited was how could we create objects that would have a cardinality between Aleph, one, Aleph 0 and Aleph 1. It was the big idea, right? In set theory, it's not forbidden. I mean, it's proven that you can't prove it with set theory. It's proven that you can't disprove it with set theory. That's what Paul Cohen did. So it means that maybe one day you could construct something by playing with trees, because already it was all about playing with trees. This tree here, its set of branches when you push to infinity is the number of real numbers, so it's Aleph 1. But the set, of course, of um, integers is Aleph 0 in cardinality. And the idea was maybe if we fold it, maybe if we, if we torture trees, we could start creating series that would have special paradoxical behaviors. I just called them paradoxical at the time. I didn't mean we could straight ahead build something that has an intermediate cardinality, but maybe you know, folding trees and messing with trees could start creating interesting things. And this is how it started. I played with trees and then I was like, oh, maybe actually, you know, when you cross trees, you create stuff. 
And uh, that's how I started studying collets, and it was uh, many years ago. So it was all thanks to Solomon Pfefferman in the first place. Had, had he not invited me at Stanford, and even though I didn't become a professional mathematician, I became a consultant, but um, had he not invited me at the time, I would never have made those studies. And another gentleman was helpful for me. He was uh, Alan Tower Waterman Jr. So he's an engineer, but um, he hosted me while on campus because it's so freaking expensive to live in Northern California and even more today. And I really am grateful for that. And uh, another person was one of my teacher. And to be honest, I was a terrible student of his. Really, really a terrible student. And from where he is, I think he's, he's laughing quite a lot. Actually, maybe this is what he's doing, uh, looking at me from where he is right now. But Patrick de Arnois was my uh, set theory teacher when I was at uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure. Uh, I enrolled in, uh, in biology with a focus on theoretical, mathematical biology. And that's why I told you about morphogenesis and chaos theory and all that. This was what I was most interested in. But Patrick de Arnois gave me my course on set theory. And I, that's with him that I learned about Paul Cohen. I learned who Paul Cohen was through him. That's why I was so crazy when I knew my cubicle was right in front of his office. And um, he studied braids. And what he did with braids um, was an inspiration in my work, definitely. So uh, it was quite difficult for me, of course, to come up with a popular introduction to the Collatz and Furstenberg conjecture that I hope the first part will, will have all of you interested in some way. And thank you for all of you to have stayed for the second part. But this was also a seminar, trying to make a popular presentation of, of my original works. But essentially, you could blend the two conjectures, the Collatz and Furstenberg. They should be studied together. Their core fundamental problem is the same, and I mean absolutely the same. And studying multi-unary algebras is really, really cool. Thank you so much.